So Hugh Foy, you all have seen him for many years, those of you that have been coming back. He's a professor of surgery here. He actually is head of one of our teaching colleges. We've divided up the medical school into multiple small colleges, and he's head of one. And he basically mentors and helps teach a smaller group of students throughout their entire medical school curriculum. And I think it really has improved the quality of the education and the experience for our medical students. Only, I think, 25 professors are invited to serve on these teaching colleges out of probably 2,500. So it's definitely an honor. He is busy at Harborview. He is director of the surgical specialties clinics. And you all have heard about Harborview in the news, trauma. So you can imagine they're busy. For his undergraduate degree, he went to Stanford medical degree in Nebraska. He then thankfully came to Seattle where he did a surgical residency and we're glad he stayed. He stayed on to do a burn surgery and surgical critical care fellowship. And his clinical interest you will see very vividly <laughs> in his pictures. And I think I should warn you, um, vivid is definitely an appropriate term. Um, there will be quite a few interesting photographs and hopefully you can handle them. Um, this, this lists his interest, trauma, infections, gastrointestinal surgery, uh, intestinal tract issues, and complex wounds and abdominal wall hernias. I mentioned his talent for teaching. Um, he actually did an extra fellowship, uh, a teaching scholars program that we have here. He was already a phenomenal teacher, but he wanted to learn how to do it even better. He has won the Distinguished Teacher Award from the medical students multiple times. He also received an award for mentoring the medical students, the Margaret Anderson Award. The students, they asked him to be their commencement speaker a few times. And he lectures around the world. Uh, I noticed 183 different lectures, different places. I think this proverb is important to add here. Better than a thousand days of diligent study is one day with a great teacher. This is going to be just one hour, and I think it's going to be well worth it. Now, I have to end with this. This is Hugh. He's going to be very rested. Uh, this is uh, Hugh with his family, his wife and two sons. And uh, he tells me last week they had great snow. They were um, north of Yellowstone. And I think he's rested, recuperated, and we're in for a wonderful presentation. Have fun, Hugh. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Joanne. <laughs> Well, uh, sometimes I feel like Sisyphus pushing a rock up a hill, if you know that Greek myth. And this is a picture of that famous hero pushing that rock. And some of the cases that we run up against at Harborview feel like that rock going up the hill. <clears throat> what I want to do tonight, though, is to help you understand the mechanics of how the human trunk, that's the chest and abdomen together, actually work, the anatomy and the physiology of it. And appreciate there are some common and some not so common abdominal wall defects or hernias that we're called upon to fix. And obviously my practice at Harborview, sometimes we get the biggest of the big, the worst of the worst, but about a third of my practice actually is bread and butter, regular general surgery, just like any community surgeon would do uh, at your local hospital. Um, I'll also give you some ideas of, of the principles and the things that go through our mind when we try to plan the reconstruction, particularly of some bigger or more complex abdominal wall defects. Start out a little bit with some anatomic diagrams. And on the left there, you can see a see-through version of the chest and the abdominal cavity, and, and the upper third of the abdominal cavity is actually resides underneath the rib cage on the right side. And when you're looking at anatomical uh, diagrams, it's like you're looking at the patient. So it's the patient's right. Here you can see the uh, liver underneath the rib cage, and then the spleens back here, both of those commonly injured in blunt force trauma, the stomach, the colon, and the small intestine. In a closer view, you can see that the division between those two cavities is this big sheet of muscle, our diaphragm. And the diaphragm moves up and down and helps us to breathe. Now the abdominal wall is layers of muscle, seven layers of tissue, many of them muscle. As you can see in the diagram in the upper uh, part of the left picture here, 
of skin, fat, some dense connective tissue called fascia. We call it at the table gristle, that dense surround on the muscle. And uh, then you have multiple different layers. And if you cut through the abdominal wall, as you see in this diagram, you can see that it's muscle interposed by layers of oftentimes fat. And when you go to the store, you buy a slab of bacon, that's what you're looking at is basically this part of a pig's wall, okay? Sheets of muscle, which is uh, separated by fat. It's hard for me to get away from my Nebraska roots here. Uh, <laughs> you know, days hauling meat out of the packing house, but uh, if you'll just bear with me. The ab rectus abdominis muscles that run up and down the middle of the abdomen, the so-called six-packs, you can see in the, in the left-hand diagram as these muscles right here and here, and they're surrounded by some very dense connective tissue. Most abdominal operations these days, open operations, and a lot of the port sites for minimally invasive or laparoscopic operations, like when we take people's gallbladder out with a little telescope, the majority of the uh, incisions go through that dense connective tissue in between those two rectus muscles that run up and down the front of the abdomen. Now here's a young fit trunk, right? And those ripples in there are known as the six pack, generically speaking, but also we call them the, the uh, inscriptions, the transverse inscriptions of the rectus abdominal muscles. On the sides are where these sheets of muscles come in. Now the way we breathe is that that diaphragm moves up and down. Our rib cage moves up and down if you look from the side. And what it does is it creates negative pressure in the chest so that we basically suck air into our lungs. Now that volume has to go somewhere and it pushes down on the abdominal contents. So as a consequence, if you look at this diagra diagrammatically, on the left side you see a patient in exhalation. Breathing when you breathe out is a passive phenomenon. All you have to do is relax and your chest comes down and your diaphragms actually come up. So here on the left side you can see the chest is nice and skinny. The diaphragms in those two crescents of uh, red. When you take a deep breath, the diaphragms, those red crescents flatten and come down, and the chest wall expands, and that light blue area is the volume that's created when the bellows opens to create that negative pressure to suck air into your trachea and expand your lungs. So, the problem is, so the net pressure inside your chest cavity is always negative. It's either zero or it's negative. There's a vacuum there. As a consequence, because these two cavities work complementary, the net or average pressure inside your abdominal cavity is always positive. Now, that positive pressure is helpful when we have to cough when we have to empty our bladder or empty our colon and everything, that helps get those jobs done. But things inside your abdomen, your intestines, your stomach, this sheet of fat tissue, the omentum, are always looking for a way to escape. And that's what job security for me as a hernia surgeon, okay? <laughs> Here's a trunk in motion on the left at rest, nice and flat. And you can see the CD collection in the background there for reference, and if you keep your eye on that one light blue one, suck it in, take a real deep breath, and you can see how the abdomen becomes concave, or scaphoid as we call it in medical terminology, and then relax or pooching it out, it'll come out. And that's a young, fit, mature trunk, and as a person gets a little older, things get a little bit more slack, a little bit more weight on board, you can see it changes a little bit. And with the increased incidence in hernias, actually parallels to a large extent the increased incidence of obesity in our society as well. So this increased abdominal pressure is helpful in uh, normal activities. It's increased by when we lift, when we push, when we pull, when we cough. And you know, their Pilates instructor is always telling you to engage your core, right? 
Now, obesity will increase that pressure, too, considerably, just by the weight of the, in, the abdominal contents. And there are certain disease states that will do it as well. Colon obstruction, someone has a colon cancer or a, a fiber stricture from diverticulitis, they have to push hard in order to evacuate their bowels, all right? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease that we've heard about in the past is where there's spasm of the little muscles around your airways and people actually have to force the air out with each breath, right? And we give them a variety of different inhalers to relax those muscles, sometimes steroids and everything to decrease the inflammation. So, and lastly, in, in elderly men, the prostate will swell and make a relative obstruction to the outlet of the bladder. So, you know, that's why us older guys get up in the middle of the night a lot. It's not, you know, to check to see if the dog's okay. It's to, you know, because we have to void our bladders. And typically, if a man has to get up more than three times a night, that's a trigger for us getting sent to the urologist to see if maybe you need medications or some other procedure to help relieve that obstruction from your prostate gland. And as the old saw goes in surgery, a hernia in an old man is just a symptom. And you have to look for an underlying cause because if you don't, you fix a hernia, it'll come back, okay? So here's a picture of some hernias and the definition of a hernia is a protrusion through a normal area of confinement, these layers of the abdominal wall and there's some known design flaws in the abdominal wall, in the groin, and inguinal hernia. And so the abdominal contents will slowly but surely force its way into those potential spaces, and they'll dilate over years and decades of time. Sometimes you're born with a hernia. It's a sac that never closed off as the testicle descends into the scrotum in men. Sometimes it happens because of straining or pulling, and you'll hear sometimes, particularly in soccer players, about sports hernia. Well, sports hernia is just a newfangled term for what we have always known as an acquired direct inguinal hernia, where the muscles have been strained, and with repeated pressure, it just dilates over time. Now, Again, the hernias can be of a whole variety of different types. Some you're born with are congenital, like the indirect inguinal or that sac that doesn't close off. A hiatal hernia that gets a lot of press because of gastroesophageal reflux disease that we heard about a couple of weeks ago, where you have bad heartburn, which are sometimes associated. Diaphragmatic hernias, sometimes babies are born with holes in their diaphragm, and they're okay as long as they're living off the scuba uh, apparatus known as the umbilical cord, right, because they don't use their lungs when they're underwater in the uterus. But the minute they're born and they get the slap on the bottom and they take their first deep breath, they'll start to suck their intestines through that diaphragmatic hernia, and that can actually be life-threatening. Um, acquired hernias, again, can be the sports hernia or a direct inguinal hernia, or they'll happen after we've done an operation and there's some kind of mishap or failure of our closure, so-called post-operative hernia, or as I'll show you in some examples, sometimes people get their abdominal wall torn to pieces. Now, some hernias like this one are truly massive, and we hear a lot about morbid obesity, and this is someone who's actually massively obese. This person had had an abdominal wall hernia. She's obviously what we would call morbidly obese. She's more than 100 pounds over her ideal body weight, and she has a large dependent apron of abdominal wall that hangs over the normal confines of her pelvis. And so that's a pretty big day's work, no pun intended, for Dr. Klein to raise the flap, for me to repair the hernia with a large piece of some type of screen or mesh, and then for him to trim that apron back so that this patient can now more easily get around the house and walk. So there's other types of hernias. This is a patient that we had who was born with a congenital uh, lymphangioma who has had uh, multiple operations of the chest and abdomen, and you can see his whole side bulges out. And so it's very difficult. This person has to wear a big binder in order to be able to work, to cough, to sneeze, and to get around. It's such a problem these days, abdominal wall hernias, that actually there's... Uh, now, this year will be the second annual major hernia 
conference of a complex abdominal wall reconstruction that will be held in Washington, D.C., and I was very fortunate to participate in that last year, but there's actually a journal on hernias uh, for, called Hernia and uh, Association for the study of these abdominal wall defects. So it occurs about somewhere between 15 to 40 percent of abdominal wall operations will result in an incisional hernia afterwards. So there's all these new strategies, new technologies, new materials that are springing up all the time, faster than we can actually do research to study whether or not they're going to be truly effective. How many of you were here last year? And we heard the, the whole story about the FDA, right, and the approval process for drugs. Well, I can tell the approval process for materials that we put in people's body is a fraction of that for drugs. So somebody comes along with a new mousetrap, they say this is great, all they have to prove to the FDA is it won't kill you, and then they can sell it to us. And I can tell you that many of these things aren't very cheap. About 20 years ago, we started to see people who had such severe abdominal swelling from injury, shock, and hypotension, and a, this vigorous approach to repleting their intravascular volume, right, the stuff inside your blood vessels, that they would swell massively so much that they couldn't breathe. Because I have, everything would swell so much, the chest wall would get tight, the intestines would get so swollen that the diaphragms just could not get that job done. And when I was a resident 25, 30 years ago, we used to stand around and go, gosh, there's some things you just can't fix, and we'd watch them die. Well, somebody found out that if you opened their abdomen and let everything out, kind of like that one scene in Star Wars, remember the second movie, where Luke zips open the abdomen of that tom-tom, that creature on the frozen planet of Hoth and crawled inside to stay warm? Well, that's what happens when people have this abdominal wall compartment syndrome. We don't use laser swords, but in fact, we just use a, a scalpel or an electrocautery and open their abdomen, and suddenly they can breathe because the pressure's gone, and their blood pressure is restored because all that pressure inside not only restricts the diaphragm, but it also restricts the flow of venous blood up the inferior vena cava into the heart. So it's just like no blood in the heart, no blood out. They become horribly hypotensive or their blood pressure gets so low, they'll have a cardiac arrest. So we began seeing all these patients due to better pre-hospital care, changes of, and increased use of more vigorous intravenous fluid resuscitation in the field in the hospital. And so we saved a lot of people, but we were left like this guy. And the picture is, OK, now you got it open. How are you going to get it closed? So we went through this decade of trying to figure out what are we going to do, and I'll show you the, this patient later. Through the years, I've seen certain patients that came to mind that illustrate this point. First one is an elderly man who came in in the morning. We went up to the, uh, he, had, he arrested, they were doing CPR, he's on the medicine service. I said, what's wrong with this guy? And they go, ah, oh, he's a crazy air swallower. Some people have aerophasia, or they just swallow a lot of air. Some people do it nervously. We said, okay, fine. Sure enough, later that night, they called us back. They, we said, what's wrong? They said, well, he's, his blood is very acidotic. I mean, we, he, he's got a very low pH, which means he's not getting oxygen to his tissues, nor could he breathe because his abdominal wall, his abdomen had blown up so much. And they said, and he's got free air in his belly, which means the intestines have probably perforated. Me being an old Nebraska kid and my chief resident being a kid from a ranch in New Mexico, I looked at him, he looked at me. We said, well, it works in cows. What do we got to lose? The guy was about to die, so we just took an IV catheter, poked it through his elderly thin abdominal wall, pss, let the air out. All of a sudden, he could breathe. His blood pressure came back. He pinked up. We took him downstairs, found a, a, a dead piece of large intestine, took it out, gave him a colostomy, he went home in seven days. A couple years later, when I was a burn fellow, we had a girl who was engaged in an interesting youth activity, which is lighting dust balls. Anybody here ever light dust balls? Dust bunnies? Oh, it's 
Okay, I won't go there. They make this nice little sparkling poof. Well, so allegedly she was lighting dust bunnies in the closet, caught a coat on fire, there was a ski boot, plastics are horribly toxic. She got flown over to us, she was, we could not resuscitate her, we could not get her blood pressure up. She dropped her blood count, her hematocrit, and I thought, well, maybe she's bleeding inside the abdomen. So I conned my boss, Dr. Heimbach, into taking her to the operating room, and, and I was gonna do a, a belly tap, a diagnostic peritoneal lavage to see if she had blood in her abdomen. I stuck the catheter in and clear fluid shot across the wall. That she was so swollen because she had had so much fluid that there was so much pressure in there. And so she, like this patient with a very charred abdominal wall skin, had too much pressure in her belly. Another guy who had a, a common procedure to evaluate the pancreas, an ERCP, big long word means endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Basically take a special endoscope, take it down through the esophagus, through the stomach, around the corner of the duodenum, and take a picture with some dye of the pancreatic duct. Well, they'd had some problems. He perforated. We couldn't get his abdomen closed. So I closed him with uh, then a sheet of thick Gore-Tex, which is just expanded foamed Teflon, polytetrafluoroethylene. And, you know, so that was another time I encountered. And then we had a, a young kid who had been in an accident, and you can see this thin line across his abdomen by his belly button from his seat belt. It had come up over his pelvis, garroted him, and it, it tore his intestine. We had operated on him, and we took him down to fix his leg, and he got horribly hypotensive. Blood pressure dropped. It's really hard for a uh, general surgeon, particularly one who's allegedly an expert in critical care, to get scooped by an orthopedist. But I did this day, and my orthopedic colleague, Dr. Henley, said, well, why don't you just put those drains back on suction? We put the drains back on suction. Boom, kid's blood pressure came back. He pinked up, everything was fine again. And what he was doing was leaking air out of his lungs down the backside into his abdominal cavity. And we'd been reclaiming that air with his abdominal drains. Another guy hit a guardrail, tore his abdomen up horribly, bad pelvic fracture. After 28 operations, even we did all these fancy flaps and everything, and they failed. The law of Vasquez. Luis Vasquez, famous plastic surgeon, said the flap that you rotate to cover the defect will cover all portions of the wound except that most important to cover. <laughs> it's kind of the South American derivation of Murphy's Law. And there you can see the tips of those tensor fasciolata flaps that have necrosed and died. Guy ended up with a fistula or his bowel pouting out into his abdominal wall. And he had more than 25 operations, and that's what he ended up with. Another guy that got a new rifle, shot uh, uh, what was thought to be just a shack. Turns out it was full of dynamite. You could hear it for 10 miles. The crater was 100 feet in diameter, and debris fell in a two-mile radius. And unfortunately, his buddy was sitting in the cab of the pickup. It decapitated him. Best we could tell, he was shooting from the roof with his right leg around the corner of the pickup, took his leg off at the hip. They, the people in his community did an excellent job of saving his life, threw him in the helicopter, he got to us. And when we got control and got his amputation completed and everything, he was so swollen we had no place to put his intestines. So we just sterilized an IV bag, an old trick that was developed in Bogota, Colombia at one time what we call the penetrating trauma capital of the world because of all the gunshot wounds there, the so-called Bogota bag. And he ended up doing okay, and in a week and a half we had his abdominal wall closed when the swelling went down. I'm holding in my hand what's left of the head of his femur, right, the ball and socket joint, and that's what's left of his pelvis. There he is post-op, and we didn't know what to use. I said, well, let's get some of that Gore-Tex stuff, and, and this two millimeter thick Gore-Tex is pretty pricey, but nevertheless, it gave him a good temporary closure and containment and environment for his intestines to settle down, the swelling to go away, and then we eventually got his own abdominal wall closed. So we learned some lessons in those early days. That was kind of 1990 to 2000. That sometimes it's physically impossible to close somebody's abdomen. Uh, maybe sometimes you should open it when they get real tight and they're going to arrest. And a lot of the people in our early series had actually already had cardiac arrest because they were too tight. 
Children and old, older people are more susceptible to the ravages of pressure because their tissues are more compliant. And we've always known that babies will get into trouble if they get air or fluid around their heart much quicker than will a young, healthy adult. We also thought that, that if you open someone maintenance of tension on that abdominal wall so it doesn't escape and the muscles contract under the forces of gravity, entropy, and fibrosis, if you keep control of that tension headed towards the midline, you're more likely to get them closed again. Well, there are a lot of options, as you can see. You can leave them open. <laughs> that doesn't work too well. The intestine doesn't tolerate being exposed to the air because it dries out. Intestines, blood vessels, and all those things, if you leave them open to air for more than 10 days, they're going to become necrotic, break down, and rupture. Um, people just towel clip the abdominal wall together, put some dressings on, wrap them up in plastic. That's a nice, quick method. Sometimes you can put an absorbable screen of mesh over the intestines here, as you can see. Here's the liver, and here's the small intestine. And you can skin graft over the top of it. Here's the Bogota bag. Just You can see the print on the IV bag sewn to the skin. You can either sew it to the skin or the fascia. That gives a nice milieu or moist environment for the abdominal contents, the intestines, for the edema to go away. And then again, you could put, use the pricey uh, methodology of using something like Gore-Tex. Uh, or you can just use this big, this is known as the fish or the flounder. It's a McNeely visceral retractor. Uh, and you put it in there to hold the bowels down while you're closing a real tight abdomen. Sometimes you can just sew the, the visceral retractor to the edges, pretty cheap, costs you 15 bucks. So the problem then is that you've got this increased incidence of hernia. You know, to a certain extent it was a disease of technology. We got too good, we saved too many people. Our paramedics are good, our resuscitations were more res uh, successful, our blood banks are are good, we can get all of these things to stop their bleeding. Uh, but then you have this risk of incarceration when the abdominal wall contents or bowels get stuck and bowel obstructions. It hurts when you have a hernia. You, you lose the right of domain, as we know. When the intestinal uh, contents start to spill over the normal confines of the abdominal wall. Your diaphragms will go down and they'll get lazy. They don't do this with every breath anymore. They just sit here because then your belly can just do this, right? It's hard to cough. It's hard to sneeze. It's hard to empty your bladder or bear down, lift, etc. And that's not exactly something you want to take to Alki Beach or Green Lake, right? I mean, it's, it's got a lot of psychosocial implications as well. And again, this, this a large hernia is a capacitor for any pressure that you try to develop in your abdomen to do all these normal things you've got to do every day. Cough, sneeze, empty your bladder, etc. Historically, through the years, there's a whole variety of different solutions that had been tried all the way back into the 18th. Well, Beaumont, William Beaumont was this uh, surgeon for the 7th Cavalry, and they had a guy shot in the abdomen, and they just left it open. He was one of the guys that first discovered the relationship between emotions and gastric acid secretion. Because every time this guy would get upset, who he became his assistant, this little red pouch of stomach lining would turn beet red and it start dripping this clear fluid. It turns out it was gastric acid. The pediatric surgeons, just like babies will be born with a hole in their diaphragm, sometimes babies are born without an abdominal wall. And this picture shows an ingenious device developed here about 35 years ago in the biomedical engineering department with Rob Shaler, one of the pediatric surgeons at Children's, to just make a chimney to hold those bowels. And then like an old typewriter platen roller, I mean, some of us remember typewriters, right? And the platen roller in there, just to twist it down as the baby grows, the swelling goes away, and return those bowels back into the abdomen and then eventually close it. Again, and I talked about these other things, the Bogota bag, the abdominal compartment syndrome, and then finally in the mid-90s, Richardson and his colleagues in, in Kentucky described this concept of damage control laparotomy. Laparotomy is when we open and explore someone's abdomen for injury, trauma, broken spleen, gunshot wound, whatever. We used to try and 
stop the bleeding, control the contamination, and then reconstruct all the intestines. By the time we'd finish, the patient would be so sick, oftentimes they'd die. So they said, how about this? Stop the bleeding, control the contamination, wrap them up however you can, get them up to the ICU out from under the anesthetic, which has some harmful effects, get them warmed up, get them fully resuscitated with IV fluids, get their coagulation problems corrected, and bring them back in a couple of days, then sew the intestines back. And it was really a brilliant strategy. And it's caught on dramatically, and it's one of, been one of the most helpful things when our military surgeons now come back from the theater today. So you can see if you've got a hernia like this, it's like, well, why don't you just go out and exercise? Well, you can't exercise with a problem like this. You, this lady can barely walk. She wears a big binder. That's a hernia that spills out over her abdomen. She can barely get around the house, and she has to wear a big kind of expanded girdle just to keep it from swinging to and fro. So this vicious cycle of herniation, deconditioning, the pain and discomfort, the inactivity, the loss uh, of the endpoint of satiety. I had one patient had this great big skin grafted hernia, and I said, George, every time I see you, you gain another 15 pounds. He's a big portly guy anyway. And and he said, Doc, he said, I never get full. And I thought, aha, what makes us feel full? Well, we are full. We're tight, right? And we eat a great big meal. We go, oh, I can't eat another bite, right? Because there's literally no place else to put it. Well, this guy had this big, soft hernia. Shoot, he could just eat and eat and eat, and his stomach just kept stretching and stretching and stretching over the, very, the many months that I was waiting for his wounds to soften up and mature until I could try to reconstruct it. So they gain weight, people get depressed, and a lot of these people just want their life back. And one of the most rewarding things I have as a general surgeon is I can give people, you know, they can resume normal activity or they can eat again. You know, some of these people with their bowels leaking, they can't eat and they're on intravenous feeding for months at a time. Um, so how do we evaluate people for one of these reconstructive events, first it's the timing. There's a window of opportunity where the tissue is so, if, if you've had, ever had a wound or a fracture, right, you know that that first month, month and a half, the wound's hard, right, and it's sore and it's red. And there's this process of what we call wound maturation, where the wound, the blood supply settles down, the dense collagen softens up, and then things are easy to take apart and, and reconstruct. How many of you have ever had an operation or a hernia operation? Right? Remember those times where it's just hard as a rock? And I always tell my patients now, oh, you got this soft lump that you can push in your hernia? I'll tell you what, for a month and a half, I'm going to trade that for a hard lump that you can't push in. And you're going to think, you know, what is this guy, quack? But this condition of the tissues, which we call induration or woody induration, where it's just hard, dense, and it has a lot of blood supply in it, you cannot safely reoperate on people. So you've got this closed window of opportunity of six to sometimes four months where you're a fool to go in there and try to dissect intestines apart from anything else because you'll end up making whole, more holes in the intestine than you ever get apart. So the forces of adhesion of one loop of intestine to another are greater than the forces of cohesion of the different layers of the uh, intestinal wall. So timing's really important, it's key. You have to understand what are your goals and what's going to be your strategies for reconstruction. I'll show you some very complex defects. What anatomy do you still have left to work with and uh, what are the underlying conditions? Morbid obesity, lung disease, heart disease, et cetera. Patient in the bottom left there is an elderly gentleman who had walked around with this hernia that has now completely engulfed his penis because he could never get it fixed and nobody would touch him. And he finally came to us and we got it fixed. And he had a very long, complicated uh, course because we didn't appreciate all the subtleties of his cardiac problems. And so he had some CPR afterwards, our repair blew up, and we had to start all over again. Morbid obesity. This man was giant. He, weigh, he was about six foot six, weighed over 300 pounds, and you can see the dimension 
of uh, the nurse's arm on his abdomen, and that's a big, huge skin grafted hernia that when he's lying on his back, it's reduced. So do they have gallstones? Because once we fix them, we don't have to go back in there again. Do they have other conditions, diverticulitis? Do they have small bowel obstructions, reflux, a whole host of things? And are these other things, heart and lung disease, that's going to make the operation more difficult? A lot of people end up having colostomies, right? So temporarily you have to bring the bowel out and pass your feces into a bag. Well, when you have that, you can't put a piece of plastic, which is probably the best reconstructive mesh. So you have to use some of these biosynthetic materials and stage the repair until you get a definitive uh, repair. And you can see the ostomy here in the left lower quadrant of this patient. And their skin grafted hernia is now mature. It used to be hard and firm, but now I can pick the skin up off of the bowel. And there's a nice plane in there, and we can dissect between the two. I had one patient that had an open abdomen, and she was doing great. I mean, but she came back, and she was crying. I said, what's wrong? And she says, it's getting bigger. And I said, it's supposed to get bigger. I forgot to tell you that, you know? As it softens up, it will get bigger, but you know the volume is still the same. So again, you have to wait, and you have to carefully advise people and educate them what they're going to expect. And then there's just a schemata of that allowing that maturation of the wound so it's safe for us to go back until it's soft, no longer bloody, and we can go back and get things put back together. So a lot of times we have to do a staged repair. We'll go in and do part of the job, wait for the wound to heal, maybe put, take the colostomy down, put in one of these biosynthetic uh, meshes that are materials that can tolerate contamination with bacteria that from the ostomy better, go back months later and put them back together. And there's a whole host of different materials, as you see in the list there, that we can employ to do that. The fallback plan, if, if you can't get the abdominal wall closed, is just to put that screen and mesh and skin graft them. Well, when we had that guy with that big piece of Gore-Tex in there, we said, well, what's the stuff those guys use up at Children's? And we called them up, and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, you get it, you get it from these guys. And it was, at that time, made by DuPont. And it's this stretchy uh, elastomer is the generic word. They call it silastic, with a nylon stretch mesh in it. And it was great then. It was 30 bucks a square foot. I mean, that's dirt cheap. This was 1991. So we got a bunch of this stuff. Well, when DuPont got into the row about breast implants, they got out of the medical silastic business. And all of a sudden, boom, it was 300 bucks a, a square foot from another smaller vendor. So we've gone through some interesting economic times as well. The other thing is we look at their anatomy, and we always get a CT scan. And this is a CT scan of the cross section of somebody's abdominal wall. And you can see here uh, in the front, Here's those rectus abdominis muscles. Here's those muscles in the flank that attach to the pelvic brim on both sides. This guy's missing pelvis. He's got a big traumatic flank hernia, something we'd never seen before, and then we stumbled up upon. And you can see that big white thing. That's his vertebr uh, vertebral body, and here's where the spinal canal lives back here. So you want to look to see, well, what do I have to work with in terms of the components of the abdominal wall, and if had they, have they had... Uh, this heterotopic ossification, this new bone formation, and a variety of different things. Sometimes people have traumatic loss of the abdominal wall. And this guy had a board go through him from the, his right upper quadrant out through the middle. And it took, here's his open abdomen with a temporary mesh. And then here he is skin grafted as best we could get him. And he took quite a few operations. This is a young lady who was, um, got tangled up in a bobcat loader, you know, those little loaders that you use on a farm and got caught, caught probably caught her heel under the wheel and the, the blade caught her in the hip and just plucked her rear leg off completely. Just like that. And it was one of those times when everything worked great. Her co-worker, tough gal, lived, grew up on a farm, raised around livestock. She says, oh, I stuck my knee in the wound and held her as tight as I could and screamed for help. The, the local medics went out, got her to the hospital. The guys in the local hospital got together, and they got on the phone. They said, we got a problem here. And I, we said, fine. Right? That's our only answer at Harborview is, fine, sure. Go ahead and send them. So the jet went out, 
to Montana, picked her up. Three hours later, she was back in our emergency room. And it took these staged repairs. First, we had to clean all the horse manure out of her wound. This is, this is her intestine pouting out. And this is, this is her remaining left leg. Her right leg's gone. Here's a defect in her pelvis. But she had a complete loss of not just her abdominal wall, but half of her pelvis. So that was, you can't just pick up a book and, okay, what do you do when you lose half of a pelvis? There's nothing in there. So all of these things we had learned for a decade came in pretty handy. This is another guy, you know, he doesn't have rectus muscles that we can use or slide over. Do they have a piece of previous mesh? And sometimes uh, the, certain kinds of mesh will get into problems with infection or ever. And this is an interesting patient. Here's a piece of this PTFE, the mesh that's wrinkled up, pulled away, and here's a stitch into the bladder. And this, this is not a uh, cork line float. This is actually a bladder stone on a stitch that went through the bladder. Heterotopic ossification is a really weird deal. Sometimes the body in areas of inflammation and movement will make new bone in weird places. If the orthopedist could figure out how to harness this, it'd be great. But here's a bunch of bone that we've taken, you can see it on CT scan here, in between the loops of bowel. And here it is reconstructed by my back table nurse as we were, she was quite bored while we were taking the rest of his adhesions down. Um, but it's the, it's the darndest thing, and a lot of times you have to take that bone out of there. So we developed a protocol how to use this stuff, this silastic, to control the abdomen when we couldn't get it closed. We sew it to the fascia or maybe the skin. We keep it springy tight split it in the middle, try to take them back to the operating room and tighten them up every two days, and eventually we get them closed. There's this stuff installed in a very swollen trauma patient who's a couple days out after their injury and first operation. We take them back to, we seal them up with a sterile plastic drape impregnated with iodine to help fight infection. We tighten it, split it in the middle, check everything out, tighten it every two days, sew it back up, just like the seam in your pants, and eventually, most of the time, we were able to get their normal native tissue closed. Uh, when we couldn't, 25% of the time, then we'd have to put in this absorbable mesh, let the tissue grow up, and make a nice carpet of new blood vessels, granulation tissue, and then skin graft over the top, as we would in this wound. There we are putting a skin graft on this patient. There it is, again, that same patient, when the graft matures, we can pick it up, then we know it's safe to go back in there and try and put them back together. But that's somewhere four to nine months later, okay? We reported some of these things as a poster. Our first 50 patients looked like it worked good. Um, and then we got two-thirds of these people closed, and we said, okay, fine. And as we learned that, uh, that it worked, because at first we got a lot of heat from our superiors, they said, you did what? You opened their abdomen? What are you going to do now? And they said, well, they were dying. Now they're alive. And they said, well, you guys better figure out how to get them out of here. And, and so over the period of time, looking at the literature, talking to people, and taking a risk, uh, we went ahead and devised a protocol to take care of these patients. These are 13 patients who had actually had a cardiac arrest from being too tight. And as you can see, out of the 13, seven of them actually survived. So these are people that used to die. And, and now they're living, which is pretty amazing. But 25% of the time, we're left with these big, huge skin-grafted hernias. And there's nothing in the books that says, well, here's how you fix these. And we asked everybody we could. Read all the books, read all the literatures, asked all the gray-beard plastic surgeons around the whole world. And they said, you know, there's nothing. There's no off-the-shelf solution. So what do you do with this? You know, the operations are difficult. You're going to put a hole in the bowel, and then you have to start all over. There's not oftentimes adequate tissue or fascia to close them. Sometimes you close them too tight, and this yellow stuff down the middle is dead fascia, and you have to debride it back together. So when you try and close them in there too tight, you get right back in the same soup with a hernia. Well, as a result of our preliminary data, we realized, well, this works. So we started to do it more often because we knew it was safe. And here's, we actually do it sometimes in the ICU. One day I actually op opened a guy's abdomen in the emergency room because he was, he was about to arrest and that was the only thing we could do. But sometimes we just bring a cart up from the OR and we'll, if they're too sick and too unstable to take to the operating room, we'll do it right in the intensive care unit just like we would downstairs. 
There's some tricks from our plastic surgery colleagues. Ramirez and his colleagues said, well, you can delaminate the layers of the abdominal wall and slide it over. Well, that's great, but you, it'll only slide so far, number one, six centimeters from each side. And a lot of these people were already 30 centimeters apart. And you can't slide what's not there. So the people who had traumatic loss of the musculature of their abdominal wall, we were still stuck. No pun intended. Here's a guy who uh, was minding his own business after a day of hunting, and somebody bumped a hunting rifle, got him in the abdomen. He was got flown over from Nevada to us after they had done a great job of saving his life. But he ended up with this skin grafted hernia. We put some expanders in there to expand the tissue, and then we finally got him closed as well. And there he is two weeks post-op. And he went back to his job driving a truck. Um, so we looked at our first 134 patients, and these were sick people. Before we put in the abdominal wall membrane, they had 21 liters of fluid. That's a lot of fluid. We all need about one and a half a day. Okay, so these were really sick, swollen people. They had had an average of 15 units of blood transfused in the 24 hours or, or less before we installed the temporary closure. And we got 75% of them closed, and still it's some of the best results for that sick a bunch of people. And there's just diagrammatically in a bar graph what the average uh, amount of fluid, blood transfusions. And we got them closed within a week, 75% of them. So we thought, well, all right, that's OK. We were pretty happy. Obviously, the worse you're hurt, the worse you do. Uh, but then we still had this bunch of patients that had these big skin grafted hernias. And this guy, huge guy, worked as a lineman for the power company. He had a motorcycle accident. And, uh, he had this defect. That's a 15 centimeter ruler. See, so Ramirez sliding component release isn't going to get the job done for this guy. And how are you going to get him closed? So standing up, another one of his cohorts looks like this. Everything's stretched out. What we developed was we like to call it the bop for mosh. It's kind of a Dutch term with both of those A's in there. But a bilateral anterior abdominal bipedical flap for a mosh or a massive anterior abdominal skin grafted hernia kind of a mouthful, but it's a staged multiple procedures. We developed flaps, and uh, Stephen Sullivan reported it. So we developed these flaps and delay them. You lift them up, and you put them back down. And, and during that time, you condition better blood supply uh, from the top and the bottom here so that this stuff, when you move it, will move. And here's the incision laterally. And we're going to move that over on both sides to close this defect. This guy had a heterotopic ossification as big as a boomerang hanging off of his xiphoid process. You mo mobilize those flaps, make sure they fit, make sure that they're still alive, and we inject them with fluorescein dye intravenously, and then just use a black light to see if this, the tissues all have good blood supply. We had a couple that when we got them back together, the skin died, and then you're looking at plastic mesh, and that's a disaster. Um, then you have to peel the skin graft off, and again, you have to wait till it's nice and soft. There we are taking that skin graft off. This guy, we had to sew two huge pieces of plastic polypropylene screen together, tuck it in all the way from his breastbone, the body, his xiphoid, down into his pelvis, behind his symphysis pubis, and to the lateral sides of his abdominal wall. Again, make sure it fits. Close it in the middle, close the sides, and then skin graft these lateral defects. And um, it was an operation that Lauren Engroff, our former chief of plastic surgery, and myself kind of conjured up with the help of our friends. There's the donor site. Here he is two weeks later. Um, again, from the side, there's those donor defects. And there he is at a month. So now that's something you wouldn't mind taking to the beach. And, and more importantly, this guy went back to work as a lineman for the power company, OK? And uh, he is, his repair actually survived a 14-foot fall out of a cherry picker. He broke his arm. I saw him on the list. I went by and go, you again. And indeed, his hernia had stayed together, OK? I'll just close briefly with the last patient. And this was a, a fellow who crashed a light plane into the ground and then into the hangar, and then the hangar went into him. And here's a two by six going through his abdominal wall. Right here is his belly button. His head is up here. There's his cervical collar, and he's got a, 
an airway in there, and that's how he arrived to us at Harborview. Here he is about a week out, and again, you can't slide what's not there. He lost most of his rectus muscle in his left upper quadrant right here, and there you can see we're doing a, a washout or a relaparotomy every couple days, clean things up, tighten him up, and try to get things back together. We tried to lace him up like, you know, the German bodice on the, you know, your St. Pauli girl beer bottle uh, label, <laughs> and uh, hoping that would work, but just a little bit too much pressure. So we reverted to a, a vacuum dressing, and this is a technique to, uh, that facilitates wound care, also helps to create negative pressure. That hose is connected to uh, a suction device, and that sponge is, is impregnated with uh, activated charcoal to help decrease with the bacteria and the odor and to try and help shrink the defects down a little bit. And, but then he still ended up with this big defect in the middle that was skin grafted. We had to wait six months till it softened up. He came back, we went back and fixed him. We had some problems, he was too stuck, got into the intestine, so I couldn't put in plastic because it would've, probably would have gotten infected. I had to use this new material that's actually made out of human skin. So they take all the cells out, render it uh, immunologically inert, and then you can use that and put it in there. Turns out, well, that stuff stretches out too, unfortunately. And then I had to go back six months later, and finally a month and a half, I was able to go back in, put in some plastic, reconstruct him, and, and that's what uh, he ended up with. Now, that's not the most you know, beautiful thing in the world, but he's back riding his horse, working on his farm, and uh, doing all the things he loves to do. So, what did we learn? Well, you know, sometimes not everything we do in medicine is there a precedent or a published amount of data that tells us what to do. And we hear a lot about evidence-based surgery or evidence-based medicine. Sometimes, and this is probably the essence of what I like so much about our practice at Harborview, when you're up against the wall, and there's no off-the-shelf solution, it's license for creativity and to try and figure things out. And so this is just a brief tour through my last 20 years of practice at Harborview in reconstructing difficult abdominal wall defects. And it takes a village to raise a child, but I can tell you it takes a staff of over 1,000 people to reconstruct some of these horribly injured people. And I just give thanks to our residents and fellows, our nurses, and everyone that works at Harborview, which has an incredible esprit de corps. Again, the only, the only acceptable answer there is, sure, fine, OK. So we've got a couple of minutes if anybody has any questions. I would just like you to go over what happened with the girl from Montana, where she not only lost the leg, but part of the hip. How is she doing now, and what She's, did you ultimately do for her? Well, uh, the, what we had to do is we had to clean all that stuff out. I knew she needed a colostomy, right? But if once I did the colostomy, I was going to, I was going to violate and injure the opposite side of her abdomen, because we typically bring them up through the rectus muscles. And I didn't want to do that too short, or <clears throat> excuse me, too soon, because I would have lost access to the rest of her abdomen. So I thought, well, she doesn't have to have a bowel movement for at least five days anyway. So we washed her out every day, and we were picking straw and horse manure out of there, washed and washed and picked and picked and washed and washed. Then at day five, I thought, well, I could also maybe use a laparoscope and bring that ostomy through. But we were able to get a colostomy up the other side. And then we used uh, this elastomere sheeting for a temporary containment enclosure. And we never violated her midline abdomen, because we didn't want to destroy any other tissue. Then we put in a sheet of this dense human cadaver allograft uh, to reconstruct that defect where her pelvis was. And luckily, she had this big flap of skin that from posteriorly that was able to close it. Her wound closed. She went home in five weeks. She eventually got fitted with a prosthesis. She's gone back to showing her horses. 
uh, and she graduated from high school and is now in college. So it was, it was a, uh, a great result. But, it, but it, was, it was scary. It's like my buddy, the Alaskan fishing guide, he said, guide, he said you pay attention. This is fun out here, <laughs> but it's dangerous. This, this is fun, but it's serious fun. We goof up out here, we die. <laughs> You know, and, and that's kind of the essence of a lot of what we do. You know, you're, you're on the line, there, there's, there's no off-the-shelf solution, so you, you got to use your best judgment, your experience and tricks from other people, and try and get it together. Yes, sir? Um, in, in these cases where there's so much of the um, uh, body sort of exposed, I mean, do you have um, specific protocols for, um, or specific ways you reduce the amount of, um, uh, of hospital-acquired infections in those cases, or is, is it pretty much the same in any, in any case, or do you, do you have something special that you, that you do to reduce the chances of the, the patients who have all, this, all, this, uh, all of their insides exposed from getting uh, exposed well, What to do something? we do to reduce the infection? Is that the question? Yeah, I mean, do you, I mean you mentioned cleaning the, cleaning the areas on a regular basis and right. that kind of thing. Is that, is that the core of it, or is there something yeah, in addition I, to that? Yeah, you know, just uh, diligence. You know, Calvin Coolidge said, persistence in alone is omnipotent, right? Nothing takes the place of, of persistence. And you just have to get your nose down and, and just stay after them. You know, do all the things we do, resuscitate them from shock, good ICU care, some prophylactic antibiotics, but just, just serial repeated debridements and cleaning of those wounds. These are like these big, horrible, life-threatening infections. You've just got to be willing to go to the operating room every single day until the wound is clean and the patient's doing well. Yeah, no magic yeah. to it. You know, it's just, I think, basic surgical principles, and I think that, that's what's paid off the best. There's no, there's no magic antibiotic uh, or technique, but I think we've borrowed techniques from a variety of different fields. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Thanks for your attention. Thank you.